The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... all religions promise us life eternal. However, all of them present us with what some people perceive as a problem. Before one can live forever, one must take a necessary first step. One must die. Naturally, many of us would prefer to waive this requirement. And throughout history, people have tried in various ways to get around it. Has anyone ever succeeded? Listen. Rich as you are, Powerful as you are, important as you are, Bob, one day, like even the least of us, you too will die. I don't think so. I intend to live forever. Living forever? How do you propose to solve the problem of death? I've discovered in business that there's no problem that cannot be solved. Oh, Have you reduced immortality to a business proposition? Our mystery drama, The First Day of Eternity, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Norman Rose and Robert Dryden. I'll be back shortly with Act One. is a game, and therefore it must be played by the rules. Rules, we are told, are meant to be broken sometimes. So, some of us break them. And what happens? We quickly discover that some rule breakers are sentenced to mend their ways in prisons, while others are permitted to end their days in palaces. Well, whoever said life was fair, or even logical? Yes? Mr. Stewart? Cardinal Dennison is here. Oh. Well, I suppose I have to see him then, don't I? Yes, sir. For all the good it'll do him. Good morning, Bob. Good morning, Your Eminence. Well, aren't you being rather formal? I have to be formal. And I had hoped that we were still Bob and Jerry. If we were still Bob and Jerry, you'd never get in here. Oh? It's your rank that opens the door to my office. Is that the only reason, Bob? You're a prince of the church. Your position compels me to extend you this courtesy. Here, I thought perhaps it might be because we were boys together who fought our way up from the same dismal slop. Now, now, you'll find none of that around here. None of what? Nostalgia. What have you got to be sentimental about, anyhow? The good old days? I hated every one of them, and so did you. You certainly can't have any good memories of me. Ah, but I owe you a great deal. What? I used to beat you up all the time. You taught me to turn the other cheek. And it worked. As I recall, my arm got tired. I prefer to think it was for a better reason. What is the reason for this visit? I want five million dollars. For what purpose? Charity. Charity, huh? In the holiest sense of the word, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to shelter the homeless, and to heal the afflicted. Oh, Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. You find it amusing? When we were in school so long ago, we read A Christmas Carol. Now, what did old Scrooge say? Bah, humbug, I don't believe in charity. Then I take it you're not going to give me the five million dollars. Jerry, I wouldn't give you five cents. Why? I don't like people. Does that shock you? Nothing shocks me. I know you're supposed to go around saying, I love people. But I don't. I find nothing lovable about people. Perhaps if you tried to understand your fellow man. Oh, no. Let's leave that alone. I find that the more I understand him, the more I despise him. 
There are basic rules that govern all of us. All of us, perhaps. Except me. Mm -hmm. Are you different from the rest of mankind? Oh, yes. You look out at the world from this mighty citadel of wealth and power, and you decide whether millions of your fellow human beings shall endure poverty or enjoy plenty. Perhaps even whether they shall live at peace or perish in war. <laughs> Little wonder you think you're different. But you don't think so. Oh, you are. In many ways. But in one significant respect, you're the same as the rest of us. Oh, and what is that? There will come a day, Bob, when you too will draw your last breath. And then... How shall you be different? Even from the poverty-stricken, powerless, and pathetic beggar who collapses in the gutter. How? That day will dawn for you, Bob, as it will for all of us. That final day which will never come to an end because it will be the first day of eternity. You're convinced of that, hmm? How do you propose to avoid it? Well, let's say that's my problem. It's a problem that has no solution. For ordinary people, perhaps. But not for me. And why not for you? I intend to live forever. Where? Right here. <laughs> that would present quite a problem. In business, I've discovered there's no problem that cannot be solved. No product that cannot be bought. And no deal that cannot be made. Oh, have you reduced immortality to a business proposition? Well, everything in this world is a business proposition. And in the next world? Oh, that's your world. I'm talking about mine. All right, let me know if you change your mind about the five million, Bob. I never changed my mind about anything. Your eminence. <laughs> Little Jerry. Little Jeremiah Francis Dennison. Who'd have thought he'd ever get anywhere? And here he was again, doing what he used to do 50 years ago. Getting the better of me in an argument. <laughs> no wonder I used to beat him up. Now, what kind of silly thing did I let him provoke me into saying? Well, I forgot all about it. I think it was several months later. Yes? Cardinal Dennison is on the telephone. Oh, thank you. Put him on. Yes? Hello, Bob. I know you're busy. I'll get to the point. About the five million... Uh, Jerry, the answer is no. You should have given it to me when I called on you earlier. But with inflation, now it will have to be six. <laughs> I'm not going to give you six either. Oh, by the way, I was fascinated by our conversation. You really meant what you said, didn't you? About what? Living forever. Have you made the deal yet? The deal? You've reduced everything to a deal, you said. I would assume you'd already worked out one to achieve immortality. With whom, I wonder? I'm not at liberty to say. And I wouldn't pry for all the world. Well, Bob, it's been nice talking to you, and we'll do it again sometime. Goodbye. Why was this business of immortality necessarily impossible? Wasn't it something that I wanted more than anything else in the world? I decided to bring all of my resources to bear. Yes, Mr. Stewart. Uh, Miss Mart, I have a problem. The nature of the problem, mortality. Let's write that down, sir. Mortality. Hmm. My own. Yes, sir. I do not wish to die, Miss Mott. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Well, you uh, take it from there. I'll get to work on it right away. Is there anything else? Not at this time. Then excuse me, sir. What better way to introduce you to my Miss Mott? Madeline Mott. She's been with me for 30 years. The only secretary I've ever had. And I've trained her well. She simply cannot be nonplussed or surprised. Nothing ever upsets her balance, disturbs her equilibrium, or pushes her off her even keel. You heard what I just asked her to do. As far as she's concerned, I might have told her to get me a cup of coffee. 
I need your signature in two places, Mr. Stewart. Oh, yes, I see. Do you want the corporate meeting scheduled for Tuesday or Thursday? Uh, Thursday. Oh, on the mortality situation. Yes. I judged it would be a matter for research. Mm, I would agree. They decided to subject it to problem solving. Very good. I had introduced problem solving all over the corporation. It means the best brains are brought in to analyze the problem from every possible point of view. The top brains, the finest equipment, all of the considerable resources of the corporation are now being concentrated on finding an answer. I have an interim report from problem solving. Yes, Miss Mott. On the achievement of immortality, there are two basic approaches. One is scientific. Hmm. Has science found a way? Not at this time. Well, then let us put science aside. That's what problem solving recommends. Hmm. Well, what is the other approach? The supernatural. Supernatural? A catch-all term for various aspects of the mystic, the psychical, the metaphysical, and so forth. And? Well, naturally, the field is filled with charlatans. As one would imagine. Therefore, Problem Solving has called in all the investigative resources of Bob Stewart Enterprises for assistance and collaboration. Very good, Miss Mott. Have them separate the wheat from the chaff. Yes, Miss Mott. Researchers have been examining legends, documents, histories, myths, all pertaining to the phenomena of the occult. The transubstantiations of the worshippers of the Mithras, the Kabbalah, the Sanskrit Jakarta, works from every known human culture. Good. They have interviewed and investigated psychics, mystics, mediums, yogis, gurus, dervishes, exorcists, witches, astrologers. Oh, spare me the details, Miss Mott. I would assume the project is in excellent hands. That's how it's done. The united effort of a top-notch team. I realized that the end result was something that I had yearned for all of my life. Immortality. This would be the supreme achievement. And I was going to achieve it. But time was going by. Money was being spent. Resources were being consumed. And there was no progress. But how could I become impatient? Had there ever been a project like this? And of course, Cardinal Jerry would never let me forget it. One night at a civic dinner... I asked to be seated next to you, Bob. Oh, I'm flattered, Your Eminence. Uh, the answer is still no. Bob... Very soon, the sum will have to be seven million. <laughs> you never give up, do you, Jerry? How can I? Does poverty ever give up? Hopelessness? Despair? Disease? Now, concerning your personal problem... What personal problem? Your desire to live forever. Have you made any progress there? May I trouble you to pass the salt? Your eminence. I'd show him. I'd show the world. Sooner or later, my people would find a lead, a clue, which could become a breakthrough. Nothing in this world, and in the next, can withstand human determination. Mr. Sturdivant is here, sir, with a report. A report on what? Project Immortality. Sturdivant is head of security. Why would he be making... A well, all right, send him in. Sturdivant. Hey, Mr. Stewart? Well, come in, Sturdivant. Sit down. Huh. Thank you, sir. Well? Well, as you know, sir, I'm uh, security chief of the project. Now, a week ago, head of problem solving says to me, we've got somebody we want you to check out. Who? Fellow says his name is Rupert Reston. He's the uh, president, chief executive officer, and everybody else of an outfit called Eternity Incorporated. Mm -hmm. And what does this outfit do? I asked him. He told me. They sell Eternity. Eternity? He said uh, he heard you were in the market for some. Mm, well, what did you find out about him? Eternity Incorporated is registered in the name of Rupert Reston as a private company doing business in the state. But what did you find out about Mr. Reston? Nothing. There's no record of him anywhere. We managed to get his fingerprints. 
But they're not on file with anybody. We put him on the computer all over the world. Scotland Yard, the Surete. Now, we even used our reciprocity behind the Iron Curtain. Well, surely you must have learned something. There is no record that he was ever born, nor is he known to anybody anywhere on this earth. Have you watched the place? We have it staked out 24 hours a day, sir. Oh, does he have any visitors? We never see any. Does he go anywhere? Never leaves the house. Is anyone with him? He's always alone. What do you think? What does your policeman's instinct tell you? This Mr. Rupert Reston scares the living daylights out of me. And looking at it from that angle, he might scare them out of me, too. Well, it seems we have an organization called Eternity Incorporated which sells eternity. And why not? These days isn't practically anything you can think of obtainable in the marketplace. We shall see if this purchase can be arranged when we return shortly with Act Two. It seems that when there is a demand... Some enterprising businessman will come up with a way to satisfy it. And thus, fortunes are made. Financial empires created. Now, Mr. Rupert Reston claims he can sell you eternity. How does it work? Let us return to Mr. Bob Stewart, who seems to be an avid customer. How did you leave it with Mr. Reston? Uh, He said if you were interested, you could get in touch with him. I see. Well, thank you, Sturdivant. Mr. Bob Stewart, please come in. How did you know that I'm Bob Stewart? Who else would come to see me? Won't you have a chair? Mr. Reston, who are you? I am President and Chief Executive Officer of Eternity Incorporated. And you're here because you hope to buy some. Mm. But tell me, how is this deal to be consummated? Ah, well, we are quite far from that stage, Mr. Stewart. Why? (laughs) Well, things aren't that simple. Why not? First, we must determine if you qualify. In what way? Actually, in every way. Whatever the price, I can certainly pay it. Oh, there's no money involved. There isn't? Our service is free of charge. What are you saying? First, we must determine why... You want to live forever. Doesn't everyone? No, no, not really. Not after they give it some serious consideration. Most people would like to live as long as possible, but not for all eternity. But I do. Mm. Why do you want to live forever? Uh, Just a minute. Who are you? I've already told you. How do I know that you're on a level? Some of the best brains in your corporation seem to be quite impressed with me. On the basis of what? (laughs) You're out of your element, Mr. Stewart. You're a man who is fanatically devoted to facts, figures. Before you accept something, you have to be able to see it, touch it, taste it. Because I believe in reality. No. But reality may very well be... The greatest illusion of them all. How do I know that you can deliver? Well, you'll arrive at that conclusion. Eventually. Uh, I demand proof. All in good time. Now, we must return to the question that you seemed determined to avoid. Why do you want to live forever? Isn't it obvious? No. According to the rules, we're born and we must die. And those are basically sound rules. All of my life I've broken the rules. That's the secret of my success. Why should I die if I don't have to? But we all have to. Not me. Once again, why do you want to live forever? Because I enjoy life. No, you don't. Now, what are the real joys in life? Hmm? Love. I can have any woman I want. You mean you can buy any woman who's for sale? All women are for sale. Are they? Was she? Was who? 
Why do you pretend you've forgotten? Well, it wasn't my fault. Oh, wasn't it? I... I... She loved you. She trusted you. She was a foolish, flighty, silly young girl. Is that why you killed her? I didn't kill her. How can you say that I killed her? Susie Palmer. A quiet little thing. Not very pretty, perhaps, but uh, what quality? What does all this have to do with what I... Frank Palmer's daughter, his only child. And one day she'd inherit all his money. <laughs> all of his money. You make it sound like a fortune. In those days, it was a fortune. It was the foundation of yours. That's why you married her. How do you know? Ooh, there was a young priest just out of the seminary. She wanted him to perform the ceremony. Do you remember what he told you the day before? Do you remember what Father Jerry said? Do you remember? Shall we refresh your memory? Don't do it, Bobby. Don't break her heart. Jerry, you always think the worst of me, don't you? If only you knew how I long to think the best of you. All right, what's the complaint? Everyone knows you're only after her money. Well, why does she want me, Father? Only for my good looks. Well, we're even. She loves you, Bob. Because she believes there's an abiding goodness in your soul. I'll be good to her. No, you won't. You'll destroy her. Oh, come on. You'll fill the house with cynicism, greed, and dishonesty. And these will poison the air that she breathes. She'll die of it. Jerry, I, I'm not a monster. Maybe I have got too much ambition. Maybe I believe in hitting hard when I'm out to get something. But I won't hurt her. Walk away from this marriage. I can't. Please, Bobby. There are other rich girls. I'm sure. But you see, right now, I don't know any. And right now, I really need her money. Do you remember the scene, Mr. Stewart? You know I remember it. Well, then you must be able to recall another. Oh, please don't. I'm sorry. There is no way out. It was the day she finally knew, or at least was able to admit it to herself. What's the point? And do you remember? Will you ever forget how she looked at you? She never accused you directly. But did she have to? Susie, dear, you don't look well. I'm, I'm tired. I think I'll have a nap. Well, I, I think you should see the doctor. Why? Because, obviously, you're ill. <laughs> he has nothing that can help me. What cure is there for a shattered illusion? A broken ideal? I'm sorry. I have no one to blame but myself. All I had to do was look in the mirror. The truth. The awful truth was staring me in the face all the time. You mustn't talk like that. Why not? Please, excuse me. I, I'm not feeling very well. She died of it. All right. But what bearing does this have on our situation? As I said, it's all part of our qualification process. Now, to return to the basic question. Why do you want to live forever? Now, you said you enjoy life. Oh, I do. Well, what are the real joys of life? Hmm? Love. It's foreign to you. Friendship? I have thousands of friends. You only have associates who are bound to you by business interests. There is not a single human being in the world you can really trust. That's a lie, is it? There's Miss Mott. I said human being. Well, Miss Mott is a human being. Is she? Or is Miss Mott a human robot you have molded and fashioned to fit your needs? A poor, pathetic, frightened creature who, like yourself, is living out her fantasy of importance and power. Fantasy? Yes, Bob Stewart Enterprises is based on the favor of a fickle public, subject to the fluctuations of a fickle stock market. But we are talking about friendship. 
Name one friend, one loyal friend in whose hands you would place your life. Why do we have to go through all these irrelevant... You did have a friend once. You remember, don't you? No. Ah, how marvelous the human psyche. How completely it can erase the memory of anything that may prove disturbing. His name? Carl Dawson. Of course, means nothing. Carl. Ah. That couldn't be helped. Oh, really? Business is business. Is it also a jungle? It had to be done. Would he have done it to you? That was 40 years ago. What's 40 years? We're dealing with eternity. Besides, what bearing does it have on... Do you remember? It was at the golf club, at the bar. You had just cut his throat and he had just found out about it. Why do we have to talk about... We have to. Remember? You had just ordered a drink. I had the usual, Peter. Oh, here's Carl Dawson. Let's find out what he wants. What I want, Bob, is to punch you in the nose. Oh? But that'd bring me down to your level. What's the matter, Carl? Now, Bob, at least have the decency not to pretend. The opportunity was so good, I just had to take it. You mean you had to sell out to the enemy? Oh, look, this isn't war, it's business. Which I just found out is worse. I thought you'd stick with me. Well, it made more sense to go the other way. I sunk everything I had into the firm. I'll see to it that you get out without being too badly burned. Why, Bob? Why? You are old-fashioned, Carl. These guys represent the wave of the future. They deal in concepts and techniques that repel you. Make an honest product, tell your story honestly. And why do you need these vultures? To introduce some sort of chicanery. Don't you see how we no longer agree? It's high time that you retired, anyhow. Now, I'm going to fight you, Bob. You don't have a prayer. You'll go broke. We'll see about that. Carl, if you stick around, you're going to be destroyed. We'll see. All right. You ask for it. Carl Dawson. The man who guided your first steps in the business world. He didn't keep up with the times. You drove him into bankruptcy and finally suicide. Well, I gave him a chance to get out. You used Susie's money to buy into Carl Dawson's company, and in the end, you killed both of them. All right. Let's put an end to it. I must call your attention to the fact that I am a customer. I didn't come in here to be insulted. No. Since when is the truth considered an insult? I don't have to take this kind of treatment. You are always free to leave. I have come here to buy your product, to engage your services. Now, can we get down to business? Not until you answer the basic question. Why do you want to live forever? I told you. You have told me nothing. Why does the man climb the mountain? Because it's there. <laughs> you realize, of course, it's a trivial answer. Well... All I know is, I have this feeling, this need, this desire. Very well. If you won't tell me, I'll tell you. I will tell you why you want to live forever. We'll do that in Act Three, which is always the time of revelation. But as you consider it, why does Bob Stewart have so much difficulty making out a case for eternal life? It's something that everyone would seem to yearn for. But then, on sober consideration, one becomes of two minds about it. Is it really such a good idea, after all? After that. vital aspects of our existence here on Earth, and how little we know about either. When does each begin, and when does each end? Or is there neither a beginning nor an ending? Who knows? Our friend Bob Stewart, one of the richest men in the world, has been consumed by the problem lately. Again, Mr. Stewart, why do you want to live forever? Well, I, I, I just don't know how to answer that question. You obviously get no joy out of life. I... Uh... Yeah, well, shall I answer the question for you? 
You want to live because you're afraid to die. Oh, I'm not afraid of anything. Oh, not even death. Everyone is afraid of death. Yes, that's right. All of us are. But do you know what happens to most of us? We can come to terms with it. We understand, consciously or not, the logic of it, uh, the necessity for it. And if it will come to us in the fullness of time, we will accept it. All right, you answered the question for me. Therefore, let us proceed. Now, uh, just a moment. Your fears go beyond anyone else's. You don't want to meet them. You could never face them. Who? You still don't know. Why do you pretend? The people you killed. Your wife, Susie. Your friend, Carl. That isn't true. Oh, no? Of course, they're the two important ones in your life. There are hundreds of others. Don't say that. Oh, people you misled. Swindled. I never swindled anyone. I know. You merely gave them a chance to go wrong. They're all waiting for you. And you know it. Let me tell you what the truth is. Ah, vanity. I have vanity. I want to do something that, that no human being has ever accomplished. I want to be the first. I want to show the world that I'm someone unique, special. A man unmatched in history. A man who is different, better. <laughs> you believe that? Yes, I believe it. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter. We could not accept you as a candidate for immortality in any case. Why not? You don't have the qualifications. Well, who does? I don't know. In all the years I've been on the job, we have never come across any human being who did. Well, what are the qualifications? I don't know that either. What do you mean you don't know? Oh, I'm sure we'll know them when we finally see them. And now, sir, I shall not take up any more of your time. And that's how he dismissed me. Me, Bob Stewart. Well, I wrote him off right then and there as a faker of one sort or another. But as the days passed, I wasn't so sure. There'd been something about him. And then I said to myself, you don't take no for an answer, Bob Stewart. There must be something that this man wants, needs. Go see him again. Work on him. Make a deal. Mr. Stewart, do you have a private listing for Mr. Reston? No. I can't seem to find his number. Who did you ask information? There is no listing under that name. That's impossible. I had them check the address. They never had a subscriber there. Get hold of Mr. Sturdivant. Well, beats me, Mr. Stewart. Now, I went to the building and the place was empty. He was gone. Where? I, I don't know. Well, didn't any of your men see him leave? No, sir. Didn't you say that you were on 24-hour stakeout? Yes, sir. Well, then how could he disappear? I don't know. Your men, now, are they trustworthy, competent? They are experienced, and I bet my life on them. But still... Yes, sir. I doubt them myself, except... Except what? There is just too much going on that can't be explained. Well, if you don't know where he went, perhaps you can find out where he came from. You might get some information from the building management. We were there. And they couldn't tell you anything that's impossible. They would have demanded references of some kind. Uh, Mr. Stewart, the problem is they claim he never was their tenant. What? Well, they claim he never rented the place at all. But that's impossible. I was there. I know that. But he doesn't appear on any of their records as a tenant. And as far as they know, the place has been vacant. Well, did you ask around the neighborhood? Can't seem to find anyone who remembers such a person. Oh, all right, Sturdivant. And that will be all. <laughs> to that development. How could I account for it? Rupert Reston was not a figment of my imagination. Other people had seen him and spoken to him. Who was he? A very clever hustler? Or was he... Was he what? I couldn't even imagine. But somehow I felt that this had been a test. That I had been found wanting. That a way Rupert Reston had represented was now closed to me. But there had to be other ways. There simply had to be. Miss Mott. Yes, sir? Why am I not receiving any reports from problem solving? They have nothing to report. What do you mean? They're not making any progress. That's impossible. 
It is not an ordinary problem. It isn't? It's unusually difficult. Do you know something, Miss Mott? Do you realize that for the first time in 30 years, you have attempted to justify the failure of someone in this organization? No, uh, I, I didn't realize that. And for the first time in 30 years, people, top people, on whom I rely completely have failed me. Failed? For 30 years I have built this company. I was pointing toward something. I wasn't quite sure what. And then one day I had a talk with someone, and I realized for the first time what it was that I really wanted. What would give my life logic and meaning. And the people I developed and trusted, the people I made powerful and wealthy, are unable to help me. When I need them, I find them wanting. Uh, are you all right, Mr. Stewart? Of course I'm all right. Why do you ask? Well, you seem to be somewhat flushed. It's, it's because it's, it's hot in here. Oh? Uh, turn up the air conditioning. Everything is for sale, Miss Mott. Do you understand? Everything and everybody. My wife, Susie, she sold herself to me because I was handsome. Carl Dawson sold himself to me because he thought I'd save his failing one-horse business. You sold yourself to me, too, Miss Mott. You knew that I wanted a machine, and so you became one. You did, didn't you? Yes, Mr. Stewart. You gave up any thought of a life for yourself because you knew I would need all of your loyalty, all of your energy, all of your time. That's true, Miss Mott, isn't it? It, it is. But I made you rich, too, didn't I? Yes, sir. Then why do any of you have cause for complaint? Who does this Rupert Reston think he is? I can face all of you in the next world. I, I'm not afraid to die. But I'm not going to. I'm going to live forever. Forever. Uh, Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart. Get an ambulance quickly. <laughs> You're paying the price, Mr. Stewart. For what? For a lifetime of bad habits, too much food, not enough sleep, exercise, too little or too frenzied. What's going to happen to me? I don't know. Well, then get someone else in here. <laughs> if I did, he'd only call me in for a consultation. What has to happen? If only we could get you a new body. Well, why can't you... So far, we don't know how. Why not? We would have to do a tremendous amount of research. What's holding you back? For one thing, money. Suppose money were no object. You're talking about heaven. With money, you can even build heaven. What do you need? I wouldn't know where to begin. Begin at the beginning. We would need schools, hospitals, laboratories, clinics, research centers. Miss Mott, are you taking all this down? I am, sir. Doctor, if you could get me a new body, or if you could completely renew my old one... Yes? Does... Does that mean that I could live forever? Well, literally, yes. I believe you could say that. Then how long would it take for all of this to show results? I don't know. Could it happen in time for me? Once again, I don't know. But it's the only chance I have. What's that? I'll do it, Doctor. Don't spare the expense. Move as quickly as you can. From that day on, I devoted myself to the Bob Stewart Foundation for Eternal Life. I don't even know how much money I spent on buildings, on scholarships, on research, on experimentation. Miss Mott has all those figures. And Dr. Patton reports to me regularly. We must work with all parts of the human body. Blood, nerves, glands, all the processes. How do we renew? How do we rebuild, rejuvenate? Are we beginning to see daylight, Doctor? I think we're beginning to come through the night. Good. Good. Remember, I am to be the first beneficiary of all of this. That is our agreement. Absolutely. That is our agreement. It's a race against time. I don't know if I can win. It's the most important dream I ever had in my life to be denied me. I grow weaker every day. 
I need a miracle. Why can't I get the miracle? With whom do you have to make a, a deal for a miracle? Hello, Bob. Is... Is that you, Jerry? Oh, no, don't try to talk if it's too much of an effort. Jerry, you were right when you said that day will dawn for me as it does for everyone else. Oh, this is the day. I feel it. I know it. I was wrong, Bob. Oh, no, no. You were right. None of us breaks the rules. All of us are born. All of us die. None of us can live forever. Not all of us. Some of us will live forever. Maybe. But not me. Bob, now listen to me. You're going to live forever. How can you say that? I, I'm going to die tonight. Your dream. It's come true. You knew how to do it. You knew how to make it happen. All over the world, you'll live forever. In all the hospitals and schools and laboratories. In all the generations of doctors who will learn there. And all the people who will be healed there. Is that true, Jerry? Is it? Well, then, then I don't have to be afraid. No, of course not. And, and even if I lied, stole, cheated, even killed for the money, in the end, I gave it all back. Yes, Bob. You gave it all back. And that's all that will be remembered. That's why you're going to live forever. Thus, we reverse Mr. Shakespeare, who said that the evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft interred with their bones. No, these days a more kindly and forgiving world buries the evil and enshrines the good. And why not? Good and evil, reverse and obverse sides of the same coin. So much depends on the way it falls. I shall return shortly. Does anyone really die... Isn't our world the sum total of all our acts and thoughts and feelings? Isn't our impact on the world, no matter how slight or seemingly inconsequential, a part of the collective consciousness? Matter, says the scientists, can neither be created nor destroyed. And since we ourselves are matter in one form or another, we must go on forever. Of course, instead of asking ourselves, does anyone really die? we might with more profit inquire. Does anyone really live? Our cast included Norman Rose, Robert Dryden, Earl Hammond, and Tracy Ellis. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.